Good afternoon. I call this meeting to order. A quorum is present. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. And pursuant to Committee Rule 4, House Rule uh, 11, Clause 2H4, the chair announces that he may postpone further proceedings today on the question of approving any measure or matter or adopting an amendment on which a recorded vote or the yeas and nays are ordered. The committee procedures for remote hearings remain the same. If you're experiencing connectivity issues, please make sure that you or your staff contact our designated technical support so those issues can be resolved immediately. And if you wish to have a document inserted into the record, please ask for unanimous consent and have your staff email the document to veteransaffairs.hearings at mail.house.gov. Without objection, members will be recognized in order of seniority for questioning witnesses day, and this will make it easier for me to assure, ensure all members participating have an opportunity to be recognized. Does any member have a question uh, about the proce procedures for this hearing? Hearing none, we will proceed. So thank you for being here today. We have two orders of business today. First, we will handle some committee organization matters, and then we will immediately proceed to our oversight hearing. Today, we welcome a new member of our committee, Representative Sheila uh, Scherfelis McCormick of Florida's 9th District. We offer her a very warm welcome. Representative Scherfelis McCormick is the first Haitian American elected to Congress from Florida and will be a, another crucial voice for Florida's 1.5 million veterans. As a longtime advocate for quality, affordable health care, and working Floridians, she will bring her valuable experience to uh, the Economic Opportunity and Technology Modernization Subcommittees. Um, I recognize Chairman Levin for any remarks that he may have. Chairman Levin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, Representative Cheerfulis McCormick. I've enjoyed getting to know you in your first few months in office, and I'm thrilled to have you on the House Veterans Affairs Committee. You've already hit the ground running with your legislation included in yesterday's Economic Opportunity Legislative Hearing to permanently authorize the flexible use of homeless program funds at VA. I look forward to working with you further this year on behalf of our veterans, and I hope for a long time to come. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Uh, thank you, Chairman Levin. Uh, I now recognize Chairman Mervan for any remarks he may have. Uh, thank you, Chairman Takano. Uh, I would also like to enthusiastically welcome Rep. Cheerfulis McCormick to the Subcommittee on Technology Modernization. Uh, as a former healthcare executive, I'm confident that Rep. Cheerfulis McCormick will be a tremendous asset to our oversight of the Electronic Health Re uh, Record Modernization Program and our efforts to ensure that patient safety remains a top priority as VA modernizes its IT infrastructure. Uh, with that, I look forward to working with Rep. Sherfulis McCormick, and uh, I once again welcome you to the subcommittee, and uh, we all expect phenomenal things of you. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Chairman Mervan. Um, in addition to assigning Representative Sherfulis McCormick to subcommittees, we'll also be making a change among the Republican membership as Representative Elsey will be joining the Health Subcommittee. And with that, I recognize Ranking Member Boss for any remarks he may wish to make regarding these subcommittee assignments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also want to uh, welcome our newest colleague, uh, Representative uh, Surfless uh, McCormick, to the, the committee. And as you know, Dr. Murphy resigned from uh, our committee due to his appointment to the Committee on Ways and Means. Um, I want to thank Dr. Murphy for his contribution to the committee. Don't understand why he would want to go to Ways and Means instead of being on Veterans Affairs, but we'll have to talk about it later. So, uh, but fortunately, we do have a deep bench of talent, and I'm pleased to offer uh, a resolution to assign Representative Elsey to the sub to the subcommittee on Health. In addition to being a retired naval aviator, Representative Elsey brings his experience as a former uh, commissioner of Texas Veterans Commission to his, to our work here in Congress. He's a great asset to the committee, and I know he will bring a tremendous amount of passion and knowledge to the Subcommittee on Health. And with that, I yield back. Well, thank you, Ranking Member Bost. Uh, I now recognize Chairwoman Brownlee for any remarks that she may have. Chairwoman Brownlee. Chairwoman Brownlee? Uh, you're, you're muted, Chairwoman Brownlee. We need to, can you unmute?
Brown. Chairwoman Brown. Okay. Chairwoman, we'll continue going on. All right. Um, now, let's move on to the first resolution offered to assign Representative Sherfulis McCormick to the committees. I recognize Vice Chairman Levin for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that the subcommittee assignments for Representative Cheerfulis McCormick as set forth in the resolution be approved. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah. Th uh, thank you, Chair Vice Chairman Levin. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. Uh, the ayes have it. The motion is agreed to. On the second resolution Perfect. offered by uh, ranking, offered by Ranking Member Boss to assign Representative Elsie to the Health Subcommittee, I now recognize Vice Ranking Member Radawagon for a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move to adopt Ranking Member Boss' resolution to appoint Representative Elsie to the Subcommittee on Health. I yield back. Thank you, Representative Radawagon. All those in favor will say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. The ayes have it and the motion is agreed to. This concludes the business meeting portion of today's proceedings and we will now proceed to the oversight hearing. Uh, I will now recognize, recognize myself for an opening statement. Today's oversight hearing is entitled Building a Better VA, Addressing Healthcare Workforce Recruitment and Retention Challenges. Now, this hearing could not be more timely. This week happens to be National Healthcare HR Week, which recognizes human resources professionals in healthcare organizations across the nation for the important role they play across the continuum of care. Additionally, earlier this week, in accordance with VA Mission Act, uh, the VA Mission Act of 2018, VA released recommendations for modernization and realignment of its medical facilities. These recommendations will be considered over the coming year by the Asset and Infrastructure Review Commission, or AIR Commission. The committee is still digesting the thousands of pages of documentation published on Monday and what this means for the future of VA healthcare in various markets. I intend to hold a separate hearing on the Air Commission recommendations. However, one thing is abundantly clear. VA can improve buildings and build new facilities closer to where veterans live. But if VA does not have the workforce to staff them, it cannot deliver on our promise to veterans. As the committee evaluates how VA formulated its Air Commission recommendations, we will carefully examine the extent to which the department has factored its human capital needs into the equation. VA's ability to meet healthcare staffing needs has long been plagued by complex hiring authorities, non-competitive salaries, lengthy onboarding processes, and a lack of integration across information technology systems and other administrative barriers. These challenges have only been compounded by uh, the COVID-19 pandemic over the past two years. Throughout this global public health emergency, VA's workforce has remained steadfast in its commitment to caring for all those who have served. VA's dedicated staff cared for more than 540,000 veterans diagnosed with COVID-19. They've administered vaccines to almost 4.5 million individuals. They have cared for non-veterans by deploying to community nursing homes and other non-VA facilities to support pandemic response. They have done all of this while continuing to deliver world-class health care to the more than 6 million veterans who rely on VA for care. At the same time, the pandemic has led the private sector to offer increasingly attractive salaries, bonuses, and other recruitment incentives, which are making it harder and harder for VA to retain experienced physicians, nurses, and other providers. According to VA, its turnover rate among registered nurses has hit its highest level since 2005. VA is struggling to compete. I am pleased, therefore, that Representative Underwood's VA Nurse and Physician Assistant Raise Act was enacted with the Fiscal Year 2022 Consolidated Appropriations Act last week. But there is so much more work to be done. In a speech in Charleston, South Carolina on February 9th, Secretary McDonough outlined 10 priorities for investing in VA's workforce. It's human infrastructure. VA recently stood up the Reducing Employee Burnout and Optimizing Operational Thriving or Reboot Task Force, which is examining ways 
to improve systems and processes that contribute to employee burnout at VA medical facilities. The committee applauds both of these initiatives, but it is clear that we need to do more to strengthen VA's workforce, and the committee stands ready to help. I look forward to hearing perspectives from the department's witnesses, as well as witnesses from the American Federation of Government Employees and National Nurses United, two labor organizations that represent VA's frontline healthcare workers. I hope that today's hearing will help us identify, uh, help us all identify some actionable steps to address long-standing human resources challenges at VA. We must work together to ensure VA's healthcare system will be prepared to care for those who have borne the battle for generations to come. Ranking Member Bost, I now recognize you for your opening remarks. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I appreciate the opportunity today to discuss staffing and hiring changes VA faces nationwide. In any organization, your people are your most precious resource. That is true of the VA as well. VA is the second largest agency in the federal government. It is staffed by more than 400,000 hardworking professionals. Many of them are veterans themselves, and they work every day to give veterans the care and benefits they've earned. Most of them work in the VA's health administration. Their jobs aren't always easy, especially over the last two years, but they perform life-saving work for veterans and their families and caregivers and survivors. We do, have to, we do have to hold them accountable when they fail, but we owe them a debt of gratitude, and we owe it to them to ensure that they have what they need to succeed. That is what I look forward to, to discuss, discussing this afternoon. Any organizations as large as VHA is going to have a constant employee turnover. That is why, even though VHA's turnover rate is better than its in industrial peers, the VA healthcare system has about 50,000 vacancies right now. That's a big number. Most of those vacancies are from docs, nurses, schedulers, social workers, and housekeeping aides. Those positions are critical to keeping the VA hospitals and clinics up and running, and it's hard that it's harder than ever before to find workers to fill those positions. The American Hospital Association, Association recently called the health care provider workforce shortage a national emergency. VHA must use every tool at its disposal to, comfort, to confront that emergency. VHA must bring new recruits on board quickly before they are at a loss to the other organizations. VHA must m maximize retention incentives to keep good workers at VA and make the most efficient use of the existing workforce. VA, VHA must install the right IT tools to guide hiring efforts, identify facilities that are struggling. VHA must also end the va vaccine mandate for healthy health care workers. The VA healthcare system has about 50,000 vacancies across the country right now. The VA healthcare system also has about 40,000 workers who have requested an exemption to the vaccine mandate. Every one of those exemption requests should be honored. Veterans are waiting weeks or months for care in certain areas and in certain cases. Staffing shortages will only make those wait times longer. That could have life or death consequences for veterans. With the market as tight as it is, the last thing VA should be doing is interfering with their employees' pers personnel, health, personal health decisions, much less firing anyone for exercising their health or religious freedoms. Veterans have fought to prevent, preserve those freedoms for centuries. It is wrong for VA to erode them in the, in, the, in the name, in veterans' names. I urge the Secretary to revi reverse the mandatory, uh, this man mandate immediately. And Mr. Chairman, with that, I yield back. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ranking Member Bost. Um, I will now call up and recognize our first witness panel, uh, Ms. Gina Grosso. Assistant Secretary for Human Resources uh, Administration Operations, Security and Preparedness, the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. And she's accompanied by Ms. Jessica Bongiorni, Chief 
VHA uh, Human Capital Management uh, for the Department of Veterans Affairs. I want to thank you uh, for being here and remind all of our witnesses, all, um, all of our witnesses today, to pause for two to three seconds before speaking and answering questions. Uh, Assistant Secretary Grosso, you were recognized for five minutes to present VA's testimony. Chairman Takano, Ranking Member Bost, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the Department of Veterans Affairs healthcare hiring and staffing opportunities, as well as the state of VA's human capital management programs. I am joined today by Ms. Jessica Bongiorni, Chief Human Capital Management, Veterans Health Administration. I would also like to recognize our labor partners, some of whom are with us today. VA has great respect for our labor partners and the key role they play in taking care of the nation's veterans. We look forward to our continued collaboration. It's an honor to be with you today to discuss steps we are taking to attract and retain VA's number one asset, our great public servants. We know that investment in our employees is an investment in veterans. Investing in our human capital infrastructure is critical for the VA to function effectively. Secretary McDonough recently shared 10 steps VA is taking to invest in its workforce. Those steps, which are summarized in my written statement, are designed to foster a workforce that is treated with dignity and respect. The VA cannot increase access and improve outcomes for veterans without investing in our people. And thinking about investing in VA's employees, I want to take this opportunity to personally thank the committee for its support of the RAISE Act that the President signed into law on Tuesday. We are grateful for your support. The VA has more than 400,000 employees and continues to grow each year. Healthcare is the largest part of VA's mission, representing nearly 90% of VA's workforce. As the largest integrated healthcare delivery system in the United States, VA's workforce challenges mirror those faced in the private healthcare industry. Across the private healthcare sector, hospitals and ambulatory care centers have reported higher turnover, increased labor costs, and increased reliance on travel nurses. While VA's turnover rate has historically been extremely competitive at or below 9.6% annually, that rate increased to 9.9% in fiscal year 2021. This is due in part to higher wages and bonuses offered by private healthcare systems, coupled with COVID-19 pressures and burnout. The Secretary's 10-point plan is intended to combat these challenges. Despite these challenges, VA's unique mission attracts new employees each year. Nearly 30,000, 30% 30 of VA's workforce are veterans themselves, who identify closely with our mission. VA continues to lead the way in using telehealth and mobile deployment clinics to reach veterans living in areas defined as health professional shortage areas. VA is a leader in virtual healthcare delivery and is well positioned to expand in this area. In VHA, human resources modernization efforts are underway with the goal of standardizing processes to increase efficiency in HR processing. While national policies exist for HR functions, variability in local processes has led to inefficiencies. This variability also makes it difficult to automate processes with modern information technology systems. HR modernization shift to shared services was a key factor in VHA's ability to accomplish significant surge hiring during the pandemic. VA acknowledges the concerns raised by customers and other stakeholders about delays in the hiring and onboarding process, and we are actively working to address it. In VHA, an onboarding optimization team is currently working to standardize and reduce steps in the pre-employment and onboarding process. We continue to develop staffing models across VA, and we have just started the work to develop staffing models for all VA medical centers. The staffing models will contain sufficient detail to inform BAMC requirements and will help each VA, VHA network allocate resources that will produce the best outcomes. It's an honor and a privilege to be part of this noble mission to care for our nation's heroes whose service and sacrifice is so inspiring. I look forward to working with each of you on healthcare hiring and staffing opportunities across VA, as well as investing in our current employees so they can provide the best care and services to our veterans and their families. This concludes my testimony. 
My colleague and I are prepared to respond to any questions you have. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for your uh, testimony. And I think uh, uh, I now recognize myself for uh, the first question. Uh, so, um, Assistant Secretary Grosso, as I've said in my opening statement, we want to help VA be successful in its efforts to strengthen the workforce. Um, what would you say are the three most important things that uh, can be done legislatively? Well, I would start with the, the, what you've already given us in the CARES Act. Um, those authorities were critical to our success the last two years. Um, and anything that we can do to extend those authorities would be much appreciated. So our ability to, to have less regulation over hiring, uh, less regulation over caps on retention authorities, uh, um, less um, um, restrictions on how we pay awards and bonuses, um, and to your point, to help us be more competitive with the private sector that we compete with. Um. So just, it's mainly the extension of authorities that you enjoyed during the, uh, uh, the pandemic. Um, we just passed the RAISE Act, which I know is a major priority for your department. Thank you for uh, your thank you, actually. Uh, uh, which statutory constraints, um, oh, well, you already answered this question in your, in your original answer. Um, how can we address, uh, well, how, let's turn to the 10-point the uh, plan that uh, Secretary McDonough put forward. Um, how can we help address that 10-point plan uh, for investing in, work for, uh, in workforce um, investment? I think the best way you can help us is to help support the budget we submit. Uh, as we try to implement some of these, some of them will require funding. Um, and um, please know that that funding goes directly to taking care of our employees that take care of our veterans. And so I think that's the thing that would really support us the most. Okay. Now, just well, I want to give you one more chance uh, to answer. What I'm really interested in is any new author any new authorities. I mean, you talk about continuing the authorities under uh, that we the emergency authorities that we granted. Um, but any new authorities or legislative fixes that VA is looking for in terms of addressing its workforce needs. Anything that you would say now. Uh, thank you for the question, sir. I think uh, there are a great many things that we would welcome the opportunity to discuss with the committee. Uh, in addition to the RAISE Act, which is going to be great for us, there are a variety of other occupations in addition to uh, nurses and physician assistants who will need some assistance uh, in a, uh, modifying pay caps. We've had some difficulties recruiting our entry-level staff, so while the recent change to the minimum wage for federal employees is a, is a good thing, we will need more. Uh, we also will need some ability to have a streamlined personnel authority, as you mentioned in your opening statement. Uh, our, our hiring authorities are too complex right now, and so having a simplified, streamlined version that would allow HR staff to have an easier time bringing people on board would be helpful. Um, so we'd be happy to work with you on more details. Yeah, the, on, the onboarding um, has been a long-standing issue. Um, uh, on more than one occasion, Secretary McDonough has said that he wants Congress to make permanent some of the expedited onboarding flexibilities, which you just talked uh, that I've talked about, uh, that we were grant that we granted the VA during the pandemic. And I want to clarify: Is he asking us to allow VA to complete certain essential onboarding tasks like fingerprinting, background checks, and full verification of, of clinical qualifications within a certain number of days after the employee start date? rather than before the new hire's uh, first day on the job. Go ahead. Yes, that is one of the things that we would like to ask for an extension and to make permanent. As was mentioned, we have a team uh, right now actually in DC working on improvements uh, with process improvement engineers on the onboarding process and one of the things I believe they're going to recommend is that we make those uh, actions permanent. That would uh, allow us to bring people on quickly and still have the opportunity, if there's an issue with their uh, background, to uh, go ahead and let them know that they can't continue employment with us, but we'd get them in the door quickly. Well, what, if anything, are you doing to ensure those essential onboarding tasks are still completed within a reasonable amount of time after a new hire's first day 
and that no task has been left undone. We track the completion of those tasks in the USA staffing system, which is the system we use to onboard our employees. So we are tracking that information. Well, I, you know, the thing I'm worried about is the inherent risk of delaying these tasks, which I add, which I'll add, was articulated in a, mem a memorandum the VA Inspector General sent to VA leadership about a year ago. It is not difficult to imagine the worst case scenario. Um, if those tasks are not completed in a timely manner or at all, VA could end up employing unqualified, clinically incompetent individuals or individuals with criminal backgrounds, people who would be delivering health care to our veterans while having access to controlled substances and veteran sensitive health information. And those risks would absolutely have to be mitigated before I could support changing the existing law. So I need to just really know that you're going to have uh, administrative processes that will ensure that these tasks are indeed completed <laughs> uh, in a timely manner. Uh, so uh, that, those are my concerns. Uh, Ranking Member Voss, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Grozo, uh, VHA has uh, approximately 50,000 vacancies. VHA also has a vaccine mandate that it's approximately 36,000 employees have requested an exemption from. What impact do you expect enforcement of the vaccine mandate to have on VA staffing shortage already? I think it's early to tell what that impact will be, but to your uh, earlier opening statement, we are not questioning the validity of someone's request for a religious or a medical um, issue. Um, but what we are trying to do is make sure that we have a safe, um, environment for the veterans that we see. And, I understand. Um, and so uh, we are working hard to, um, for those individuals to find a place where they can work. So that's our first. Okay, that, that would have been my follow-up question. You know, what accommodations is VA making to allow employees who have requested an exemption to remain at work while caring, caring for the veterans or actually be, maybe offset another job someplace else, whatever our, our possible testing or whatever needs to be done? Yes, sir. Our, our, our sincere desire is not to have to lose anybody, um, and we are doing our best to accommodate all those, these individuals that have asked for it. Right. I mean, we all want safety for our veterans. That's why we're here. Yes, sir. Uh, but we also know that possibly letting 35,000 more go in when we're 50,000 short is just kind of hard to explain. So. Um, also, then I had another question. Uh, you know, right now the VA's turnover rate is about 10 percent. You brought that up, 9.9, .9, uh, which compares favorable to, uh, to the VA's private and, and public sector peers. The American Hospital Association recently called the uh, clinical workforce shortage a national emergency. Uh, now, given that fact, uh, that most of the VA's workforce is clinical, do you expect to be able to maintain VA's 10% or less turnover rate through this next fiscal year, or do you think it's going to increase on what you're seeing with trying to get the workforce available right now? Well, I don't want to predict the future, but we are seeing it, it be, it, the numbers are moving, slowly moving in the wrong direction, and that's where the, or the legislative expansion would be, would be very helpful. Okay. Um, Sure. Um, as was mentioned, we are continuing to see a little bit of concern. Normally at this time in the fiscal year, we would have seen a growth in our workforce of about one and a half to two percent, and right now we're flat. Uh, and so we are still trending behind because it's becoming more difficult to find people out there for certain occupations, and that turnover rate is continuing to stay a little bit uh, more than what it is normally. Okay. So when, we, when we're looking at the, how does, how does, it break down as far as clinical staff, administration staff, and HR staff. Uh, are you turn on turnovers? Do you have those numbers? Is it is it mostly clinical? Do you have administration staff you're losing as well? And and do you know the numbers break down on those specific jobs? Sure. So our nursing turnover is, as was mentioned, trending at around 8.8 percent over last fiscal year. Where we're seeing increasing turnover continues to be in those entry weight, entry level positions, housekeeping, food service workers, um, medical technologists, health techs. Um, that we're having some challenges there. Yeah. And and my last is just a statement, and I want to associate myself with the with the chairman's remarks. 
as we free up or allow you to keep doing the fast hire that we are doing uh, because we need people in, we want to make sure that the people we have, that we're not all of a sudden bringing someone in and, and, and backing away from making sure that proper background checks are done. The worst thing that could happen is one of our veterans suffer in one way or another by somebody who is either uh, incompetent or criminal, has a criminal background uh, that would be a danger. And I, it's just my hope that we would figure out a way to do that as quick as possible as well. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, thank you, Ranking Member Bost. Uh, Chairwoman Brownlee, uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Grosso, the, um, the VA, as we all know, has prioritized suicide prevention as, as our top clinical priority, and yet we're still losing um, uh, too many uh, veterans to suicide. And certainly, uh, despite the uh, demonstrated commitment from the national office, considerations uh, at the local level often complicate efforts to ensure veterans have access to the full continuum of mental, uh, mental health providers. Uh, for example, the uh, Big Springs facility in West Texas, this came to my attention, recently made the decision to eliminate its psychiatry residency program, arguing that they could not justify using what would otherwise, uh, what would otherwise be clinical time to provide basic supervision of, of psychiatric residents. This local decision appears short-sighted um, and counter to national efforts to address psychiatry sort shortages in the VA and improve access to psychiatric services for veterans who need them. So my question is, do you know if Big Springs is adhering to the requirements of VA's mental health staffing formula? which is specifically designed to promote hiring at a level shown to prevent suicides, and um, how much adherence or non-adherence is there uh, overall at the vision level across the VA? Ma'am, I can't answer that question, but we will, of course, take it um, for the record and get that answer to you soonest. Sure, and I would add, uh, we are seeing improvement in our staffing levels for uh, mental health positions, and we are using the tools that you have given us through the Mission Act to include education debt reduction program expansion and some of our scholarship programs to really focus on targeting psychiatrists as a key occupation to fill. Well, and I do know that there is a lot of autonomy between um, Visions, medical centers, and central office. I, I, I don't know whether there is autonomy uh, here uh, in, in this space at all, but um, if there is, please let me know. If, if there isn't, I guess the question is, you know, how do we increase transparency and, and accountability uh, at the vision level um, for decisions like this that are, you know, a top priority? in terms of suicide prevention. I think we share your concerns and want to make sure that we are addressing them. So we are uh, happy to take that back for the record uh, and provide you additional data on what we're doing at that location in particular. Okay, um, terrific. So um, another question I have is, uh, is around a, a, a uh, around a local issue in my district. Um, I am very, very excited about a uh, new CBOC uh, clinic opening up uh, in, in my district, and it's going to be a wonderful, excellent resource for uh, veterans in our community. Um, uh, the, uh, however, we all know, again, a building is just a building. It's about staffing. Um, the current CBOC that we have right now, we've had a terrible time um, keeping uh, staff at the level needed uh, at the current CBOC. It is a CBOC that is um, uh, th that we uh, contract out our employees. They are not uh, VA employees. So I'm interested to hear what your plan is to fill uh, the vacan vacancies that will be uh, necessary to fill the staff at this uh, new clinic. Um, and others perhaps like it across the country. 
Uh, we're happy to work with you on the specific CBAC where I don't have the details, but however, I can tell you that we are expanding our investment in human resources professionals and recruiters. Uh, and we think that that investment in additional recruitment staff is really going to help us bring more people on board quickly. Okay, well, just you know, just for your information, this um, this CBOC will, most of the people from the old CBOC, since they were contracted out, are likely not to come over to the new CBOC, which is going to be um, a, a non-contracted out, and it will be VA employees. And so there's going to be a lot of staffing need um, at this facility. And I, I just, you know, I, I'm very concerned about having a great new facility for our veterans, but the lacking uh, the personnel we need to actually run it. So I just, I pass that on for your information and um, look forward to working with you on it. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Chairwoman Brownlee. Uh, Ms. Radawagon, I recognize you for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Takano and Ranking Member Bost for holding this hearing today. It's nice to see you in person again, and I'm optimistic that we can eventually get COVID under control to the point where this becomes the norm again. I want to thank the panel for your testimony. Uh, Ms. Grosso, what actions has VA taken in the last two years to make VA's clinical workforce more resilient? And what would you say VA's top recruitment and retention challenges are, and what are you doing about them? Uh, if I may, uh, Congresswoman, I would like to speak to this topic. Uh, as Chairman Takano referenced in his opening statement, we have established the Reboot Task Force, of which I am the co-chair, along with Dr. Upton, our acting uh, Deputy Undersecretary for Health and the nurse executive from Los Angeles. Uh, and we are taking that time to really dig into burnout and understand what are the real drivers for our employees and what can we do to help them. We do focus on whole health for our employees and identify ways that we can give them protected time uh, to take breaks or to invest in their well-being. Uh, we offer uh, employee assistance program services, uh, and we're exploring whether we may or may not need any legislative assistance uh, to help us continue on that path. Uh, so that group is is reviewing recommendations from the field right now actively and getting ready to um, share recommendations with our leadership. As for our recruitment and retention challenges, they were some of the same ones that we've referenced already. Um, so we have challenges with our onboarding timelines that we are actively addressing uh, to bring people on board more quickly. We also have difficulty because there's a shortage of qualified candidates in the market. And so we use some of the authorities that you all have granted us uh, to create new people who can do the work through our scholarship programs uh, and bring them on board with a service commitment back to VA. Um, we also have complexities in our authorities and in our pay structures, and that's where we'll continue to need your assistance to address. And uh, Ms. Grosso, how, if at all, would future surges in COVID cases at this stage of the pandemic impact VHA's recruitment and retention efforts and ability to meet workforce growth targets? Well, I think we've proven that we've been very agile as we've seen surges in, um, in the level of, of virus across the nation. Um, and I would presume we'll be just as agile as we have uh, in the past. Um, to continue being able to recruit and retain people um, to continue to do our mission. So, so I think if past is prologue, I think that we will be agile enough to, to address that, and we follow that very closely. Um, every, we meet every morning at 8.30 with the secretary, and, and that's one of our primary discussions. We're watching what's happening in Europe and what's happening in Asia. Um, we're very cognizant of what's going on with our supply chain, and um, do we have the supplies we need? So we're constantly planning for for the next um, event should it happen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, uh, Ms. Radawagon. Mr. Lamb, I recognize you for five minutes. Uh, thank you to our witnesses for appearing. Uh, Ms. Grosso, I wanted to ask about uh, follow-up to the RAISE Act that we did pass, um, specific for uh, the effect on slightly lower scale nurses. I know our efforts are designed to help um, nurses in, in pay grade four and five, uh, but we've gotten some local feedback in Western Pennsylvania that there's also a bottleneck at say grade two to grade three. 
uh, retaining those nurses. Is there any specific effort underway by VA right now to really target nurses more at the beginning of their career for retention so that they can survive to, to have those higher level promotions? Thank you, sir. I would like to address your question. Uh, yes, so we are taking a close look at that. We're doing a number of things to try to assist the nursing workforce. Uh, as we implement the RAISE Act, which we are very grateful for, we will first be focusing on making adjustments to those who are already impacted by the pay cap that this addresses. And then once we've completed that, we will move forward with doing reviews of additional pay scales for other impacted nurses. Um, but we're also investing in education and trying to assist our onboard employees to further develop develop themselves by going back to get additional degrees and help, uh, degrees and help them with their education. Um, and we are taking a national approach to training our HR staff who work in compensation uh, so that they can be more proactive in assisting managers and making adjustments to pay schedules. Thank you. Um, I, I think with nurses, unlike maybe some other jobs, um, the issue is, is pretty clear cut, one of money in a lot of cases. I mean, education is great, but the the pay of nurses has just really skyrocketed in a lot of cases due to high demand and the ability of travel nurses and all that sort of thing. Um, do you feel that you have the budgetary flexibility now to raise pay for some of these lower level nurses um, in the way that you'd like to? Uh, we are hopeful that uh, if our FY23 budget request is approved, that we will have additional flexibility uh, to make those adjustments. We also are looking to invest in uh, entry-level nursing programs so that we have an RN transition to practice program where we can offer more slots for new graduate nurses to come in uh, and transition uh, to care. So we are excited about those investments, but we will definitely need your support for our budget to do that. Great, thank you. Relatedly, um, just moving slightly beyond nurses, um, is the VA looking at any partnerships with community colleges in particular, where you know you're essentially recruiting or giving opportunities to uh, those students at the beginning of their careers, almost or at the beginning of their time in school, almost like the way you do for medical students? Um, are any of those partnerships existing to try to give the VA an advantage over other employers in terms of attracting? you know, not just nurses, but nurses, nursing assistants and med techs and, and people of that nature. Yes, at this time, many of those uh, relationships are at the local level, so uh, uh, with individual hospitals, but we are looking nationally as part of our investment in diversity, equity, and inclusion to identify new partnerships that we can make uh, with minority-serving institutions to identify if there are uh, talent pools that we have not yet assessed. So we'd welcome the opportunity to talk to you about that in more detail. I'll look forward to that as well. I think that's a way the VA could achieve a real advantage in terms of recruitment. You just have so much to offer um, these new students at the start of their job that the private sector doesn't always, and such a great history of really being a training system um, and a, a system where people want to start their careers in public service. So we're happy to help with this in any way uh, that we can. I just want to echo the, the chairman's uh, questions, which is we need to know uh, what you need for help on this. I know it's a very competitive market. So please don't hesitate to ask because we want to help you fill these positions and make sure that your employees who have really worked hard and shined in the last couple of years are being paid what they deserve. Um, and with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lamb. Uh, votes have just been called, but I'll continue to recognize people. We're pretty close to the floor. Um, uh, General Bergman, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Since I walked in just a second ago, I want to make sure I'm looking at the right person when they ask the questions. Uh, Ms. Grosso, uh, VA estimates 36,000 vaccine mandate exemptions have been filed by VHA staff. Any idea how many employees in a critical need occupation have filed for this exemption? Sir, I don't have that data, um, but we can certainly get that. Okay, so let's assume you get the data. Is VA also prepared to deal with the potential impact of the vaccine mandate on its smaller, more rural facilities 
where it may be extremely difficult to fill an occupation should that person no longer be there? Sir, if I could share with you, we are not questioning anybody's uh, medical or religious request for an exemption. We take that on face value. What we're doing now is trying to understand how we can uh, make sure that we can keep them safe in, in the work, in the environment they're in, um, or find another location where they can be safe. It is our sincere desire not to lose any employees um, because they've requested an exception. As we've said, stated, our employees are our most important asset to take care of our veterans, and so that is certainly not our intent. Okay, so if if these, um, I understand that the exemption requests are being processed individually uh, by the relevant employee's service line chief, I think is the, the terminology. Um, do these service line chiefs receive any sort of standardized uh, instruction VA wide uh, in how to actually um, facilitate and then make a decision on whether an exemption is valid or not? So are they get any, you know, training so that you have a, if it's, if you say yes in Oklahoma, you'd say yes in Michigan, you know, whatever it is, standardization. Uh, yes, Congressman, we do have uh, clear guidelines for managers to make decisions around. Each case has to be evaluated individually, but we do have policy guidelines uh, and we have developed training that service chiefs have been uh, trained on the concepts of what they need to evaluate when they're making these decisions. Is there any, uh, uh, if you will, if you're going to do the training, I'm, I'm guessing it's either PowerPoint or there's some you know, online, whatever it is that they do, uh, would it be possible to actually, for if one of us, member of Congress, requested to go through that little training piece that we could? I believe we could accommodate that, I yes. would. I would be very interested in, uh, in doing that. Um, um, now, also, now, let's say if an exemption is granted, uh, but accommodations, uh, uh, such as testing or social distancing cannot be granted, then the VA will reassign the employee. Um, where do you reassign them? Where would you reassign them? And could you potentially end up reassigning a clinical professional to a desk job? It is possible but that would not be the first choice. So generally, we may consider taking someone from a higher risk area and reassigning them to a, an area where um, the veterans who are being cared for there are not at a higher risk. Uh, we may move them to a position that has virtual responsibilities, for example. Um, but all options are on the table uh, before we take any type of administrative uh, steps to take any kind of action against an employee. Okay, well, um, with that, I, I know, uh, one of the things that we cannot get back is time. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Uh, thank you, uh, General Bergman. Uh, Mr. Pappas, you're recognized for five minutes. Thanks very much, Chairman Takano, and thank you to um, our panelists here for this important conversation. I want to draw attention to the epidemic and the crisis, really, of veteran suicide and how that issue intersects with um, the workforce challenges at VA. So, um, you know, I know that VA continues to struggle to recruit and retain the mental health professionals that they need. Um, and I think that there are other tools that are at VA's disposal that it could work harder to implement. Um, I want to refer to one. This is the Clay Hunt Suicide Prevention for Veterans Act, signed into law back in 2015. It authorized a pilot project to encourage more psychiatrists to choose a career with VA by offering medical school loan repayments on par with those offered by other government agencies and in private practices as well. Um, this goes alongside a number of other initiatives that VA has undertaken uh, in terms of loan repayment and incentives uh, for providers. Ms. Gross, I'm wondering if you could update me on the status of implementing this specific psychiatric loan repayment program and why, if there is, uh, why does there continue to be a delay? Congressman, I would like to address your question. We have uh, 
taken the approach of using the existing education debt reduction program to continue to invest uh, in mental health professionals. And so we've used that quite extensively to uh, recruit and retain mental health professionals to include br blanket approvals uh, for all psychiatrist applicants. And so anytime someone comes on board who is a psychiatrist, they have automatic access to using that program. Um, we also are using that to focus our uh, scholarship programs uh, to include the specialty education loan repayment program, which in its inaugural cycle had 13 uh, uh, em new employees coming on board with that, seven of whom are psychiatrists, and we anticipate awarding 25 psychiatrist scholarships this year through that program. Okay, so as it pertains to the specific Clay Hunt program, um, that's not fully implemented at this point in time? Or are there, are there other steps that VA can take on that front? Uh, we, I'd be happy to come back and give you more details on that. We've been really focusing on our other scholarship programs implementation. Okay. Well, um, I look forward to checking in and getting a little bit more detail on that. Um, I want to switch gears and talk about VA policing. Uh, this is an issue that my oversight investigation subcommittee has devoted a great deal of time to. Uh, it's important because we know that VA faces uh, non-clinical staffing shortages as well. Um, as of last September, the VA police force was short. Uh, 1,600 officers, um, that's below its authorized staffing level, and it has a nearly 30% vacancy rate. I think this put, puts veterans and also visitors to VA medical centers at risk, and it overburdens officers who are already doing uh, an incredibly difficult job. So based on the conversations that I've had with officers, um, the police staffing model VA has spent two years developing, hasn't been implemented uniformly across all of our medical centers, along with other initiatives aimed at recruitment and retention. So I think the good ideas at VA headquarters aren't making their way out into the field in all cases. I'm wondering if you have a status update on the VA police staffing model and if you can offer any comments why it hasn't been fully implemented at all 138 medical centers that have a permanent police presence. Yes, sir. So the police staffing model is complete and we are testing it at a location to see that we've got it right. My understanding is that we will implement that across the VA uh, in a couple months. Um, and you may. Sure. In addition to the staffing models, we've implemented a standardized organizational structure and upgraded the grade structure across the system for police so there are more opportunities for advancement. We're also actively using our direct hire authority uh, to bring on police. We've hired nearly 700 using that special authority. And we have a new program that we have joined in partnership with the Department of Defense and their Skill Bridge program to try to create a, a pathway for our transitioning service members to come in to the police occupation. So we have our first pilot of that program uh, that starts uh, next month where we'll have transitioning service members coming into the law enforcement training center. So we think that's gonna be a new good pipeline for us. Thanks for that answer. And in the remaining time I have, I just wanna address the issue of uh, the salary differential that VA police officers face versus um, the industry standard. Um, we know that some special rates have been offered, but this is not necessarily across the board. Um, and I'm just wondering, uh, and maybe we could take it for the record since I'm running out of time, um, if you can address the issue of pay scale adjustments that would make salaries more competitive and why it's taking such a long time uh, to, you know, get these things implemented. My time's up, so maybe um, I can, you can take that back for the record and uh, give me a response. Thank you. Uh, back, Mr. Mr. Chair. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Pappas. Uh, Mr. Banks, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As I'm sure you know, the VA has recently released its Asset and Infrastructure Review, which, has requ which was required under the Mission Act when it passed in 2018. The VA has made some striking recommendations this week, including closing three inpatient hospitals around the country, including one of them in my district. Ms. Grosso, what feedback are you hearing from staff about the proposed closures? Sir, we're getting a lot of feedback, and which is which is really what we want. And as you know, that is is a was a very big undertaking, uh, with a lot of of thoughtful study, and the, as the recommendations have come out, um, I, I realize that it can be um, positive for some and not so positive for others. Um, we we worked hard to collect the right data to understand where our 
veterans are and where they're going to be in the future. Uh, and we used that to make some recommendations. We also looked at the health of the infrastructure uh, because we know much of our infrastructure was built in the 40s to the 40s to the 60s um, and tried to make smart recommendations on where we need to go in the future. And it's the secretary's um, concern that if we don't invest in some infrastructure, our only option will be pri privatization. And, and, our, and, and we are very much focused on wanting to continue to be able to take care of the veterans we serve. And so the recommendations that we made actually will allow us to, to take care of 150,000 more veterans where they are. Um, and we actually believe that in the long run, we will actually need more employees, not less employees. So please don't look at that report and think that, that any, we don't need the staffing. We, we think that we will need more staffing with the proposals that we've made, but we're also quite cognizant that these are proposals. They will go to the commission. The commission will uh, obviously take, do the work that they need to do, and then it will go to the president. So we, we, we know that there's a lot that can happen between what we submitted and what actually happens. Understood. Can you talk about the effect that the proposed closures might have on staff who have to wait three to five years before finding out if they're going to lose their job? Well, we've shared that we're, we're leading the way in virtual and telehealth, and so we think there's a lot of options to be able to keep those employees. One, obviously, we can help move them to another location in the VA if they're interested, but I realize that that's someone's home. And so we, we hope that we can leverage our telehealth capabilities and keep those people employed. And are you already seeing staff changes as a result of the recommendations, or will those staff changes be delayed until after Congress votes on the changes? I believe it's too soon to see staff changes, but we've been working very hard to let our employees know that they are important. And in fact, that's one of our biggest concerns when the report was released. Uh, we need we need our employees. We need them now, and we're going to need them in the future. And we have a place for them in the future. That's really our message. And no matter what decisions are made, nothing is going to happen, most likely, in the next five years. Um, so even if employees are nervous, we're trying to let them know that nothing is imminent in your position. And, we, and the Secretary has made a pledge that he will always keep them informed of where we are. Can you speak about the difference between a traditional community-based outpatient clinic uh, or CBOC and a multi-specialty clinic? Apparently, that's neither one of our expertise, sir, so we will make sure we get that for the record and get you an answer. Um, understood. Um, and, and can you also talk about the different hiring authorities and, the, and what kind of problems that you're encountering when it comes to filling roughly 50,000 vacancies and, uh, and the, the, hiring author the three different types of hiring authorities that it takes to fill those positions? Can you talk about that at all? Uh, Yes, sir. We do have uh, Title 38 authorities, uh, Title 5 authorities, and hybrid Title 38, which is a mix of the two. Um, underneath those, we have in the range of 120 different authorities underneath them that we use to hire people. It's very complex, very easy for people to get confused about how the process works. Uh, and so we would welcome the opportunity to have a more simplified, streamlined version uh, of that approach. The pay authorities are all tied up within those hiring authorities as well, uh, which is why we end up needing uh, specific assistance on individual occupations, because each occupation has a different way that we pay them. It seems like that would go a long way to filling uh, 50,000 vacancies or more uh, throughout the VA, which is very important. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Banks. Mr. Mervan, you're recognized for five minutes. Ms. Grosso, uh, I'm sure that you're aware of the challenges with the balance of contractors versus federal employees with the Office of Information Technology. For VA to be successful with technology modernization programs, we have to have enough federal employees present, not only to monitor contractors, but also to be planning for the future and working across VA to help with IT requirements, development and needs assessments. Does it make economic or policy sense to keep spending money on contractors when we should be investing in our federal workforce? Also, what can Congress do to help, with, help you with providing greater incentives for IT professionals uh, to work for VA whether that is more competitive pay or making it easier to onboard them in a timely manner. And then thirdly and lastly, 
Uh, we've also heard concerns regarding attracting higher level IT professionals because of the requirements for supervision that come with higher salaries and pay grades. I realize this may be a better question for the OPM, but is there anything that you can do to help mitigate these issues at VA or would this require a legislative change? We recently, we have finished the IT staffing model. So we now have, we now know what we need on the IT side to service the entire Veterans Affairs. Our new um, Assistant Secretary has looked at that model and where we have government employees and where we have contract employees. And he is comfortable with that ratio. Um, he could have obviously made some changes to that. There are certainly flexibilities that we have a contract force that we don't have with, with the with the generals with the government workforce, and we absolutely would welcome some loosening of the requirements as in the GS 12, 13, 14, and 15 requirements in particular. To your point, um, must be a supervisor, uh, but I honestly don't know if that requires legislation. But we'd be very interested in working with you on that. Okay. May I also ask uh, if you can share, or if you know off the top of the head, the ratio uh, that you're speaking of? Sir, I don't, and I will take that for the record and get you that information. Okay. Uh, with that, uh, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Mavan. Um, I don't see any of the members that is, are we still expecting them, Ms. 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 Oh, Ms. Frankel. Oh, okay. Oh, here it is. Okay, Miss Frankel. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Frankel. But Miss Frankel, I have to go to a Republican. I'm sorry. Um, okay, go ahead. Hold on, just a second. Uh, Ms. Mr. Moore, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thought they were going to miss me there for a minute. Uh, Ms. Grosso, I understand the challenges you face, especially hiring staff. I uh, I have a family member who just graduated. Well, actually, she's doing finishing up nursing school and. She got offered a $15,000 bonus the other day. It was like just walk in the office and we'll hire you here at the hospital. And so I understand those challenges. One of the things we've been dealing with is the traveling nurse issue as opposed to they get so much more money than the nurses who are on site. So as I begin to investigate what was going on, oddly enough, we give the, the hospitals tax credits for hiring the traveling nurses. And so we're kind of creating a problem here in government. I know y'all find that hard to believe. But we're actually creating problems sometimes to fill the needs, you know. And so, so I, I, a couple of questions I have. And, and uh, first, let me say, uh, Ms. Grosso, when, what actions ha has the VA taken in the last couple of years to kind of help the VA maintain the resiliency of the workforce? What, what, what are you guys doing to try to maintain it and keep the resiliency? Well, we certainly have wellness programs, and that's what um, we have been trying to be, be more cognizant of what we do we need to add to those programs um, to continue to take care of our workforce and to better understand what the challenges they face. Um, so currently doing things and investigating on how to do more um, and, and bringing the employees into it um, so that we understand their perspective on, on how we can help them. If I may offer, sir, one of the things you that may. we've identified in uh, in our our work, there's been a lot of work that's happened in healthcare around burnout and what what drives it. And while we do spend a lot of time looking at uh, improving the resiliency of individual employees, um, that's really addressing the symptom and not the cause. And so we are trying to take a closer look at what are the systemic issues that are happening within the organization. Are there administrative processes that we can eliminate? Uh, are there things that employees just find annoying or burdensome? And those are things that we can take a change on that will impact individual employees. And, and if I might interject, that there is something that I think we could do, and, and it's certainly in the process of where you've got healthcare workers, frontline workers who were not vaccinated when the vaccine wasn't available, and they were out doing their job. I mean, I got family members that were in the middle of that fight, and now they're at risk of losing their job because they necessarily don't want to take the jab. So I encourage you. That's one thing I think will help you guys is, is that let your employees know you're going to make adjustments for them. You're going to allow them to move around. I think Ms. Grosso touched on that when General Bergman asked that question. I think that's one way you guys can help your case. And so I encourage you that. And also the onboarding process. I, my, I, got, a family, I got a lot of family members in healthcare, obviously, but uh, my sister, they offered her a job at one of the, the hospital's own base. The onboarding process, y'all, they almost missed her because it was so long and it was so drawn out. I texted her a while ago. I said, 
do you work for the VHA or the DHA? She's a DHA, so it's not the same organization, but the onboarding process at that military base almost made it impossible for them to hire her. So is there things that we're doing, I think, to help onboard and, and try to bring people in? And, and if so, I know we've touched on a little bit of that, but could you, could you elaborate a little bit more on what we're doing to get those people and get them in the process and get them hired a little quicker? And, of course, we want to hire good people. I understand that. Sure. So we are taking a close look at this with our onboarding standardization team. One of the things that we identified is that even though we have some of the same steps that need to happen everywhere, each medical center is doing things a little bit differently. Uh, and so we're trying to look at the overall process, standardize it, and then cut all the steps out that we don't need to do. Um, and then also invest in technology so that we're making it for a better candidate experience so they know what's going on in the hiring process and don't have to uh, keep asking somebody what's going on. Yeah, I think that would be really helpful. I know she was in no man's land for a long time, and the local hospitals were wanting to hire, but she really wanted a job on base. And so so thank you for what you do, and, and uh, hopefully we can help resolve some of these issues we tend to create sometimes. Thank you. I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Uh, I now recognize Ms. Uh, Ms. Frankel for five minutes. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Trying to unmute there. Uh, so I want to um, ask a question near and dear to uh, Chairwoman Brownlee's heart. I think she went off to vote, uh, but this is relative to her Deborah Sampson Act. And just wanted to know, if I, first of all, and thank you folks for your testimony today. Uh, how, uh, what kind of tracking uh, or initiatives are you undertaking to make sure that we're getting staffing that is sensitive to the needs of the women's veterans in terms of both hiring and retention. Thank you for the question, Congresswoman. This is a very important issue for us as well. Of course, uh, in BHA, about two-thirds of our employees are women. Uh, about 8% of our workforce are women veterans. And so uh, it's important to our uh, patients and important to our employees as well. Uh, we have, over the last year and a half, uh, sent out about uh, $150 million to the field to make investments in uh, women's health to include staffing. And so there's a goal to bring on uh, additional 800 positions. We have filled close to 600 of those. And so we're continuing to track that with a goal to get them all filled by the end of this fiscal year. Is that 800 positions total? Or I mean, or 800 positions relative to women's health care? Women's health, specifically. OK. And I, let me just say, compliment you on raising the cap on the child care subsidies, because I think that is a very good way to retain your women employees, which is really my next uh, uh, question. In terms of retention, are there other initiatives other than uh, obviously raising the, uh, the child care cap in terms of keeping a good environment for your, your women employees? Yes, I think for all of our employees, uh, while we appreciate what we have been given with the RAISE Act, uh, we know that VA still can't be the pay leader, so we have to be the employer of choice. Uh, and that's particularly true for our nursing workforce. Uh, and so investing in uh, internal initiatives, such as the Stay in VA initiative, where we are not waiting until people leave to ask them uh, why they're leaving. We try to ask questions earlier on and engage and create a solid relationship with employees and their supervisors so we understand what would be meaningful to them, uh, where they want us to invest in their development. And that's where we're focusing a lot of our investment in our workforce right now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I yield back. The chair now recognizes Ms. Mace for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Ranking Member Bost. Uh, and thank you all for being here today. Uh, it's an honor to serve on the Veterans Affairs Committee. My father was in the military for 28 years. Uh, we moved many times in my first few years of life. And I, I've seen uh, my father when he's been hospitalized at the VA. I've seen what my parents have gone through to get him good quality care. And I know how hard our uh, VA workers work uh, to provide many different services for our veterans, and we're all uh, appreciative of that 
effort. Um, and uh, recently, last year, I took a tour of the Ralph A. Johnson VA Medical Center in Charleston, South Carolina, where my district is located in, to see some of the innovation. It's not obviously happening everywhere. Not every VA hospital is the same, but to see some of the innovation. They have uh, 3D printers now, and they actually developed an, a, a hearing aid piece that a veteran came to them one time, and he he had this device in his ears, almost like a straw, and they decided to get a 3D printer, and they have this new hearing aid device that helped this this uh, gentleman, and it's helped many others. And so to see what they've been able to do at such a low cost to provide uh, medical devices for veterans is really innovative. So I just want to give a shout out to the executives at the Ralph A. Johnson uh, VA Medical Center. But my question today, and looking at the rise of inflation over the last year in the low country in South Carolina's first congressional district alone, the cost of living is just so tremendous. Uh, over the last year, the cost of shelter to rent a home or buy is over up over 21%. To fill a your, a your car with gas, uh, you're paying more than double what you were a year ago. The cost of a steak is up uh, 27 to 30 percent. The cost of everything is up when you go to the grocery store. And so the cost of living is it was expensive in my district already before COVID, before inflation really you know started to rise. And just in the first month of this year, inflation was one percent. Over the la course of the last year, it was 7.9 percent, the highest it's been in 40 years. But in looking at locality pay, some of the feedback that we're getting from VA workers in the 1st Congressional District about the insufficiency of the locality pay system, and particularly, you know, when you have the skyrocketing inflation rates, what are the mechanisms in place for locality pay to keep up with the pace or the cost of inflation? Nationally, you know, wages are, they're increasing about 3% Obviously, last year, inflation was 7.9%, so wages are not keeping up with inflation. But in terms of the mechanisms in place to ensure lo locality paces and that is keeping up with the cost of living, what does that look like? How is that working? What are we able to do? Because we we're hearing a lot of uh, complaints from VA workers on that issue. It's my understanding that um, GSA um, calculates the locality pay across the nation. Um, and please feel free to add if you know. Sure. So we have different flexibilities depending on the way in which someone is appointed uh, and the kind of occupation they're in. So for GS employees, yes, we have to rely on OPM to make determinations on locality pay, but most of our workforce is actually not on the GS, GS scale necessarily. So our Title 38 employees, physicians, nurses, et cetera, are on pay scales that we can modify ourselves. Um, so we are taking close looks at that and seeing an increased use of our special salary authorities internally. But I know that Charles in particular has already made an attempt with the uh, Federal Salary Council to get a new locality pay adjustment and has not been successful. It is very difficult to get through that process. So therein lies the reason I'm asking. <laughs> uh, so what's what I mean, what's what, what advice do you have? How do we get through this? I mean, this is a serious issue because the cost of living is very high in this particular area of South Carolina. So we plan to work with uh, the location in Charleston as well as several other locations in the VA to submit additional packages through that process. But uh, frankly, the answer is that the process needs to change. And what can we do to help bring change to that process? Uh, I think that you could support uh, the president's pay agent and the Federal Salary Council in making changes to that process. They've already recommended a number of changes that haven't been implemented. Um, it would require significant reform. Thank you, and I yield back. I now recognize myself for five minutes of questions. Um, the VA projects that more than 77,000 additional registered nurses, licensed practical nurses, and nursing assistants will need to be hired over the next five years to meet existing shortages. Um, that's why as a registered nurse, I was proud to champion the VA Nurse and Physician Assistant Raise Act, which would increase pay limitations for nurses and, P and PAs within the VA. This helps the department attract and retain top healthcare talent to ensure veterans receive timely, high quality care. My bipartisan bill was enacted on Tuesday as part of the fiscal year 2022 government funding package, and it can be implemented immediately. Ms. Bonjourney, can you describe how the new compensation flexibilities that the VA now has, thanks to my RAISE Act, will help the department address healthcare workforce challenges? Yes, Congresswoman, thank you so much. We are very excited about this. Uh, I know that you've been excited about it. We've been pushing it for a while. 
Um, so uh, I know that our workforce is also excited. And so um, what the RAISE Act does uh, give us flexibility for uh, new pay caps for uh, APRNs, PAs, and RNs. And so what we're going to do, first of all, uh, to tackle this is look at all of the people who we already know are at that pay cap, especially in our high cost of living areas, uh, and tackle their pay adjustments first. Uh, and so we're working on that right now. And then we'll be able to take a look at all of the other pay schedules to identify where we need additional adjustments. And great. so this is going to be a great tool for us. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the RAISE Act is a critical step, but there's obviously a lot more work to do. To address the department's health care workforce shortages that have been exacerbated by the pandemic, VA issued a directive in April of 2020 urging VA medical facilities to use certified registered nurse anesthetists and other healthcare professionals, quote, to the full scope of their license to address access shortages and other issues relevant to the delivery of health care to VA beneficiaries. That's the end of that quote. Now VA is carrying out a review to determine whether the department should expand full practice authority to CRNAs on a permanent basis, which would bring VA policy in line with TRICARE in the majority of states. A comprehensive assessment of the clinical effects of granting full practice authority to CRNAs found no patient risks when CRNAs practice without physician supervision. In other words, there is no scientific or clinical argument for restricting CRNAs from practicing to the full extent of their education and training. If VA is serious about following the science, it is imperative that the department move swiftly to grant full practice authority within the scope of their license to CRNAs, an evidence-based policy that will expand access to care for our veterans. Ms. Bongiorni, I've been urging the VA to make this move since coming to Congress. Will you commit to working with your team at VA to promptly complete the review of CRNA practice authority and make a determination consistent with scientific and clinical evidence? Uh, my team in particular isn't working on it, but I can assure you that uh, BHA will commit to you that we will continue to work on this issue closely uh, and make recommendations about a way forward. I don't know the current status, but happy to speak with you afterwards. Okay. You know, I think what's really important to just emphasize is the need to ensure that whatever direction VA goes in, it needs to be consistent mm -hmm. with the clinical evidence that VA has and the biomedical evidence that is very clear throughout our healthcare system in this country. And so um, when we talk about data-driven data evidence-based policymaking, this is an area that we would hope that VA chooses to follow the science. Um, thank you so much. And I uh, seek unanimous consent to enter for the record a statement from the American Association of Nurse Anesthesiology um, to support that. Any objections? Okay, great. Uh, I yield back. Thank you so much. And now I am happy to uh, recognize Mr. Cawthorn for five minutes. Thank you very much, Chair Owen. And to both of our witnesses, thank you very much for being here. I, I really appreciate your, your effort in trying to get good people into your organization and to the agency. Uh, I do have a question, though, for Ms. Grosso. Um, I know Mr. Moore touched on this, but what are some ways that Congress can assist you in helping the st in to streamline the onboarding process for new hires at the VA? Uh, thank you, Congressman, for the question. This is of critical importance to us. I think what we would benefit from is further conversations with the committee on how to strike the balance uh, that Chairman Takano referenced around making sure that we're hiring uh, the best possible providers while also onboarding swiftly. Many of the requirements that we have in place right now just take time to go through. And so we need to identify what level of review needs to be done for each hire uh, and what level of risk we're willing to take in our hiring process uh, and come to an agreed upon balance when we're making those decisions. So would welcome the opportunity to discuss further. Excellent. And speaking of the critical need we have, and I know there's a very critical need for people who can provide anesthesia. Uh, and rather than increasing CRNA's uh, responsibilities, I, it's my understanding that there are no certified anesthesiologist assistants working within the VA right now. And to my best knowledge, I believe that's because there's a, a different pay scale to use for CAAs. Uh, can either of you speak to that? I am aware that we don't have any on board. I'm not sure of the reason behind it, though, but would be happy to discuss why that may be. Yeah, please, if you could get anything to my staff just specifically of the reason why that is, because I, I believe there's really no better way to assist our veterans, you know, the, the people who critically need anesthesia care, 
than to really have as many CAAs on staff as you possibly can because they can assist the doctors in uh, seeing as many patients as possible and utilizing our resources in the most efficient manner. But anyways, with those questions, I yield back. Thank you all very much. The chair now recognizes Mr. Trone for five minutes. Mr. Trone, you're uh, still muted. Mr. Trone. Okay, I'm back. I had too many calls at once. You're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, my question is, uh, in the area of mental health and substance use, uh, does the VA maintain a list of every type of mental health and substance use provider uh, that's, and how many that you have and how many hirings would it take to get you up to 100% of, of all these vacancies that you have in these two areas uh, would it take to get you fully hired of FTEs? Uh, Congressman, yes, we do maintain a list of how many uh, mental health providers we have uh, and those who are authorized to provide any type of counseling or assistance on substance abuse matters. So we can definitely get you that information. That's fantastic. Do you have a trend line where you look at the demand for these services as we try to think out one, five, ten years, a trend line that shows a number of veterans requesting mental health or substance use services, and then how would you compare that demand trend line with your trend line of the openings you have for these two areas for full-time equivalents and what you have budgeted for them for the future? Uh, I am sure that our mental health team does keep that information on the trend line as far as what the demand is going to be. Um, we do expect, though, this is going to be a continued challenge area for us. Uh, there aren't enough people out there in the labor market to do this kind of work, and the demand's increasing uh, across the nation. And so we're going to have to find alternative methods or more innovative ways of providing this care. And so we're happy to work with you on identifying what those new methods might be um, to include continued expansion of telehealth, uh, but also making sure that we're utilizing the workforce we have to do the best possible care for all of the occupations that may be able to provide that care and being flexible and not just deciding it's going to be one specific occupation to deliver the care. Okay, well, I think that's fantastic. I'm a you know a big fan of uh, VA Secretary McDonough and, and think he's really moving things in a, a very positive direction and uh, very involved in the, the VA uh, a VA oversight. So you feel comfortable that the number of vets seeking medical care or SUD services, uh, do you think it's growing at a faster rate uh, than what the rate you're growing your providers at? I'd have to take that question for the record, sir, about the rate of the growth of the demand. Okay. Well, these are the types of questions I'd like to get some responses uh, on, if you could. And I'll have my staff follow up. As a member of this committee, uh, and also as a member of the Appropriations Committee, and in particular the subcommittee on military VA, uh, Mil MILCON and VA. This is the type of report we like to see from the VA so we can work with you as a partner uh, to make sure, you know, we're focusing our resources on an area that so many of our vets need help with, and, and we want to be there to help them with addiction, help them with mental health. Uh, so the information you provide our office is uh, much as appreciated. Uh, but these honest conversations about staffing are, you know, really important. And it's critical that we look uh, a couple of years out because you hit the nail on the head. Uh, there's just nowhere near enough folks we need uh, in these areas. Uh, so VA has got to figure out a way to attract them um, and keep staffing, you know, fully up or our vets are going to suffer. So thank you for your help, and uh, we look forward to some uh, follow-up on this, and my staff will be back at you, and we'll follow up on it as we move into appropriation season. I, I yield back, Madam Chairwoman. The gentleman yields. Uh, the chair is pleased to recognize Mr. Boss for five minutes. 
I thank you for allowing me a, a, a continuing to question, Madam Chair. And, and uh, there's a particular question I have, uh, uh, Ms. Rajoni. Uh, you mentioned that uh, recent pay authorization will help you uh, recruit better. Uh, you know, it's, it's a big benefit to the federal employment uh, is a defined pension plan. Most of the other in, out, uh, medical places out there offering jobs don't have that. So with the private sector not offering that, just so we know kind of where that adds, what the benefit, and if you know, I'm going to give it a round number. So let's say we pay someone $100,000. What is that benefit and how how much is that benefit, and how are you, uh, are the staff making sure that when you're doing HR that the employee to be a knows and understand that that benefit is there? That's a great question, sir, and uh, we do ha have marketing materials that we use to make sure that we are uh, giving people a picture of the total rewards of working at the VA. So I'd be happy to uh, send some of those marketing materials be great. to you so you can see what we show people because there are many intangible benefits and then there are many that uh, are hidden in their total benefits package that right. they uh, need to see written down on paper so they can understand why it may actually be a bigger total compensation package coming to work at the VA. So I'm happy Happy to share those materials with that's, you. That's that's wonderful. I'm glad to hear that you're already doing that because I think that's. I think most people just see the base salary and don't understand the other benefits that are available to them. So, with that I yield back. The chair recognizes Mr. Rosendale for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I appreciate your patience as we've been running back and forth, Ms. Grosso. I'm sorry if you've been asked this because I just missed this last little segment here. Um, I understand that the HR smart system is outdated and you want new capabilities. How much has the VA spent on the HR smart system? Sir, I don't, I can't tell you that, but I will certainly get you that information. I would like to share with you though, that we took that system on in 2012, so it's near its, its 10 year life cycle. Uh, and we are doing, starting to do the work to acquire the new system. Um, but given how old it is and, and when we were the first agency that had a, um, a, a shared service HR line of business in 2012 and we bought it to get to be really to do personnel actions and so it, it appears to be not sufficient because it's not what it was intended to be and we're very cognizant of that and we're very cognizant of what our, our um, customers need and we are be, we are working with the vendor to um, make it as best as we can and, until we we convert to our next contract but we're very aware of, of your um, concern okay so is your office soliciting industry input on what to do with HR smart so that we can uh, have you identified the areas where there are shortfalls deficiencies and 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 then working to figure out what the next system should look like Yes, sir. And in fact, we don't, we work with OIT, our office of, of um, IT, which will actually do the procurement. So it's a, it's a um, combined effort between two offices. So we sort of set the requirements and they're the experts on the IT. And I'm sure we can have someone that um, will actually do the acquisition um, come talk to you. So have you, has anyone looked far enough into it to determine whether this system can be upgraded, updated, or whether we're going to have to make an investment in a whole new system? Are you far enough down the, the line yet to determine that? Well, one of our requirements to your very point is that whatever vendor comes next, we're, we're, they've got to be able to go from go. So we're not going to wait two years to convert from old to new, and that's going to be one of our requirements. And so the question is, we, we, we've already had one vendor day, and I, I can't remember how many people came. It was quite a big number. Um, but one of the requirements will be one gets shut off and one gets turned on with the new. And so that's, that's one of our requirements. Okay. So do you think it would be beneficial for the VA to identify specific requirements and capabilities as well as an idea of the implementation and life cycle cost with a firm scheduled with defined milestones before starting the project? It's not my area of expertise, but yes, I would say that makes total sense. Okay, so I've got uh, HR 2250 that I introduced. It would require this exact uh, request that I just asked of you. And I think it'd be very helpful for VA in completing projects to actually identify what success looks like, if you will, the total cost of those projects. And it would certainly help us in Congress to do our job in oversight. So could I count on your support for this legislation? 
Sir, I'd like to go back and talk to the person that really has the authority to say that, um, but I will make sure that we get you an answer back in quickly. Okay. Um, do you reorganize the centralized human resources over the past few years? What problem were you trying to solve, and what performance metrics and data do you have to show that we are, we are achieving success? Yes, so uh, in our reorganization of human resources in VHA, we moved from a completely decentralized model to shared services over the course of the last several years. Um, we were responding to numerous external reports from the Office of the Inspector General, the GAO, uh, the Commission on Care, independent assessments, et cetera. All of our external auditors have looked at us and said, you're doing HR in a way that is not what anyone else is doing. Um, most other agencies and most healthcare systems have moved to shared services in the last 20 to 30 years, so we've been a bit behind. So we are trying to address the fact that we weren't efficient enough, there aren't enough HR staff out there, uh, and a time to hire continues to be a challenge for the system. Um, so in that transition, we are using things like time to hire to continue to measure our success. We are standardizing right now, we're in the middle of that process. The initial thing we did was to reorganize, and now we're standardiz standardizing our processes, and with that, we are establishing new performance metrics to evaluate how well we're doing, primarily around cycle time for each of the processes that HR does. Uh, and we'd be happy to get with you and explain how we're doing that uh, so you can see where we're headed. I would, I would love to uh, have that. That way we can actually see those matrix and, and, and know that we're, we're meeting them, or at least find the, um, the dates with which you're trying to, to meet those. That would be great. Madam Chair, I'm just about there. So I would, oh, Mr. Chair is back. I would yield back. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Rosendale. Uh, I will uh, ask my second question. I understand we have some of our colleagues that are going to come back, and uh, and so we want to uh, be considerate of them. Uh, so my question uh, that I'd like to ask uh, is, uh, when Secretary McDonough testified before this committee in June of 2021, I asked about the status of VA's efforts to develop staffing models, staffing studies, and internal benchmarks for each occupation across the department. Now, as of October 2020, such analyses needed to be completed for at least 57 categories of occupations across the department. And when I asked what progress had been made, Secretary McDonough said, quote, in candor, not as much progress as I had hoped, end quote. It then took at least eight follow-up requests over the ensuing six months for the committee staff to finally receive a briefing in December 2021, where we learned that none of the 20 staffing studies planned for fiscal year 2021 had been completed. So again, I want to ask uh, the VA today, where do we stand today? How many of the 57 staffing studies are now complete? I must admit that number 57 is not familiar to me. Um, we do, we have done staffing studies on functional processes across the VA, um, and and those are work in progress. Um, admittedly, with, with the advent of COVID, as we've shared, that the, the vast majority of our workforce is in the VHA, and these staffing models take a lot of direct interaction with with people doing the actual work. And clearly, we weren't going to go and talk to people that were taking care of veterans with COVID. So admittedly, the last two years, um, we did not do much work in VHA um, intentionally because obviously they were focused on other things. We did do a lot of work on the non-VHA workforce, and we now have staffing models for our Office of IT. We've got staffing models started for um, um, most of the non-VHA workforce, and we are now picking up um, back up with the VHA workforce, starting with one um, VAMC to do a model for the VAMC. Um, we expect that we can get that done in um, by June, which would get us about 80% of the workforce covered by staffing models. Okay. Well, if uh, I just want to emphasize that, um, you know, we were told that in December the VA had planned to complete all of these staffing models by May of 2022, and it didn't seem very realistic to me that that would be done, uh, a very realistic time frame. Uh, and so uh, it is of high, uh, you know, this hearing is evidence that uh, uh, we really are concerned about uh, VA staffing, and we hope we do need these staffing models, and we, we hope that you will get 
back to us um, expeditiously. Um, uh, you know, I have introduced a bill that uh, you may not be familiar with, uh, and so I don't, I don't mean to, to put you on the spot. Um, and it's outside this committee's jurisdiction. It's my 32-hour work week act, H.R. 4728, which would reduce uh, from 40 hours to 32 hours a week the threshold for overtime compensation for employees covered by the Fair Labor Standards Act. Now, the four-day work week pilot programs, there, there are four-day work week pilot programs run by governments and businesses across the globe, and they've shown promising results. Productivity either stays constant or, or gets better. Workers report better work-life balance, and they have less need to take sick days. The morale improves, uh, and they face lower child care expense because they have more time to spend with their families. Do you know roughly what percentage or how many VA employees would be considered non-exempt from the Fair Labor Standards Act uh, and therefore covered by my bill? And if you don't know the answer right offhand, you can get back to me on that. It sure will get back to you. Okay. Uh, and to what extent has VA experimented uh, with part-time schedules as a means of retaining clinical employees who are simply burned out or on the verge of resigning from VA, or even worse, leaving their professions entirely? Uh, that's a great question, and we are investing a lot of time and energy in trying to expand flexible work schedules right now as part of the Reboot Task Force. For example, for nurses looking at a 7280 schedule, uh, which is standard across industry, we also need to be more flexible in hiring part-time nurses. Uh, right now, we have fewer part-time nurses than private sector, and so we're identifying ways to get more of them. Well, it would seem to, it seem VA and other healthcare employers would want to do everything they they can to prevent these regrettable losses. And, and isn't it better to keep someone on at three quarters or half time uh, rather than lose them entirely? Yes, it definitely is. And we support workplace flexibilities and are looking to expand them. Well, uh, uh, well, it looks like you're active, you actively pursuing this, and I appreciate that. And uh, um, I urge you to take a look at uh, some of the experiments that are being done with uh, shorter work weeks, the 32-hour work week. Um, I mean, there's a lot of talk about this in very highly skilled labor sectors. Um, we have a, is Ms. Radawagon on, oh, there she is. I was like, I was looking down there. Okay, Ms. Radawagon, you're recognized for a second round. Minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Grosso, <clears throat> in addition to the historically tough labor market for healthcare workers, the baby boomer uh, generation, one of the largest in this country's history are now going into mass retirement, that'll surely have a significant impact on staffing shortages as well as demand for VA long-term ter care services. Now, how is VA preparing for that and building a pipeline of workers to replace those who will be leaving the workforce? Well, we certainly watch our, our retention numbers um, very closely, and interestingly, um, this past year, we retained 6% more than we did the previous year, so we have about a 70% retention rate, uh, which we think is actually pretty healthy um, because you have to have some, some turnover to bring new people in, but we do watch it very closely. And how has VAHA quantified the impact staffing shortages at VA medical facilities has on access to care for veterans? What impact would it have on wait times if VHA vacancy rate was even lower than it was, say, 5% instead of 10%? Uh, I do not believe that we have quantified that specifically, but I can tell you what we do take a look at is turnover uh, and the concerns that you've raised. And uh, if, if our retirement rates were to start to go up, uh, that would be a concern. We monitor that closely. We are not seeing our retirement rates go up. Um, however, I know that across the government, they are starting to go up. And so what we are doing is investing on the front end to make sure that we can bring more uh, new nurses in who are new to practice, uh, as well as employees coming directly out of college so that we keep a balanced workforce and sustain it uh, at all times. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, uh, Representative, uh, thank you, Ms. Radwack. Uh, Representative miller Meeks, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair Takano, and uh, thank you to our uh, 
uh, panelists and witnesses that are here today. If I may, I would just like to follow up uh, a brief moment on uh, Representative Radawagon's questions and questions about workforce, uh, given that we know that there is a, a large generation of, um, of veterans coming up with the baby boomer generation. Um, and so you talked a little bit about staffing, uh, but I'm wondering, has the VA done studies on length of stay within the hospital? So uh, I, I know my uh, uncle, whose ship went down in the, South, in the Pacific in World War II, was hospitalized at a VA facility his entire life and not at a nursing home facility. Um, and I know that that impacts. So length of stays tend to be longer at VA hospitals than they do at private hospitals. So have you looked at length of stay and how that affects your workforce issues? Uh, the specific issue of length of stay is outside of my area of expertise, but I can tell you that we are investing in the workforce that provides long-term care uh, and works in our community living centers. And so what we've done over the last year and a half or so is try to invest new retention incentives uh, and education debt reduction programs specifically targeted at nurses who work in those areas so that we can make sure we retain that staff because it's critical for them to have uh, continuity of care and have some of the same nurses who specialize in that type of uh, geriatric care. Uh, so we are really trying to invest in that. So is there an effort then to correlate, um, i.e. shortening length of stay to go to a long-term or skilled nursing facility, which is what we do in most other hospital situations? I would have to take that for the record. Okay. If, if you could get back with, the, uh, with us on that, that would be helpful. Uh, and Ms. Grosso, you uh, recently created a workforce management and consulting office. Uh, does this office actually provide HR services or does it oversee other HR offices? Ma'am, I'm not familiar with what you're talking about. Uh, as far as I know, we have not created in, in the HRA OSP headquarters a work work, work, work management office. Okay. So there is an office that reports under my office in VHA with that title, but it's been in existence for quite a while. Um, we have expanded some services and are looking to expand based on a requirement from the Office of Personnel Management to create new functions such as talent teams uh, that may assist us with uh, recruiting uh, a different uh, approach. So making sure that we are assessing our candidates and getting the best qualified candidates to managers. Uh, so that's the, one of the new functions we've created. And does that relate to the length of time it takes to onboard uh, at any level of healthcare providers? So I know from having applied uh, for a position at the VA that uh, the time it took for them to get back to me, which was well over seven months, uh, for most people, that length of time to apply for a physician is way, uh, or if it's a nurse, nurse practitioner, PA, is way too long. So are you also looking at in addition to expanding your workforce, streamlining the process of hiring people and bringing them on board. Yes, absolutely. We have a team of people trying to come up with uh, recommendations for this right now. They're uh, at VACO right now with process maps all over the walls coming up with solutions. So we expect to have new recommendations of what we need to do. And we'll certainly come back here and ask for assistance if they identify legislative needs to do that. I'd be more than happy to assist you. Thank you. I yield back my time. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Miller-Meeks. Um, that completes the question of this panel. I want to thank our VA witnesses for appearing today. Uh, this committee will now stand in recess subject to the call of the chair.
I now call up uh, and recognize our second panel, Ms. Mary Jean M.J. Burke, first executive president, National VA Council, American Federation of Government Employees, and Ms. Irma Westmoreland, Vice President and Veterans Affairs Chair of National Nurses United. Thank you for being here, and I remind our witnesses to pause for two to three seconds before speaking and answering questions. Ms. Burke, you're recognized for five minutes for your testimony. Thank you, Chairman Takano, Ranking Member Boast, and members of the committee. Thank you for inviting AFGE to testify today. My name is MJ Burke, and I'm the first Executive Vice President for AFGE National VA Council. AFGE has experienced concerns to this committee for many years about BHA's inability to properly utilize the many staffing tools already provided by Congress to improve clinical recruitment and retention. Congress regularly looks to new hiring authorities to improve recruitment and retention. However, here too, the problem is VA's timeliness, not the lack of direct hiring authority. Often managers and HR are unable to complete all the steps in the hiring process on a timely basis. Furthermore, most facilities do not have the budget to respond to local labor market demands. It is not unusual for it to take more than six months to complete the hiring process for scarce clinical occupations. Several factors within VA control do lead to better outcomes. An adequate number of trained and experienced HR specialists, experienced managers with good clinical skills and knowledge of VA policy, rules, and pay flexibilities, and good labor management relationships that encourage communication about pay problems and working conditions. Unfortunately, VHA centralization of HR function has depersonalized these core functions, which directly hurt recruitment and retention. Centralization makes it extremely difficult for employees to get help with leave issues, payroll errors and delays, delayed proficiencies, and lengthy administrative investigations. These investigations hurt employees and veterans by detailing scarce employees away from their usual work areas. HR centralization has taken away critical face-to-face -face interaction and left employees to deal with HR specialists who change monthly and appear not to be trained properly. This changing virtual world and over-reliance on data is perceived by the rake and file as a form of harassment. For frontline workers end up feeling like agency officials are prioritizing and protecting managers and the agency reputations instead of clinicians and veterans' healthcare needs. This is particularly true for specialty physicians and other high-priced clinicians who want to work at the VA to serve its unique patient population while having adequate life balance. When VHA over relies on data metrics without communicating with clinicians about production metrics, clinicians leave the VA. To be frank, if these doctors were motivated solely by income, they would simply choose the private sector environment. Inpatient VA nursing is currently experiencing similar strains. Shifts and days off have become less predictable because of the chronic inability to staff units. This is worsened by nursing supervisors lacking recent direct patient care experiences that allow them to empathize with the struggle of frontline nurses. Speaking up can result in subtle retaliation in the form of a bad schedule and denials of days off, which sends even more clinicians out the door. Kindness, coaching, collaboration, and competencies are virtues that will win the day for recruitment and retention. We also offer these suggestions. Labor needs to be part of the locality pay process again and be given HR data to improve oversight. Union access to payroll data will allow us to stay abreast of the causes of payroll errors. Union representatives should receive the same training on the locality pay processes as managers and proficiency award for nurses that were put on hold must be restored. Also, scholarship and loan assistance programs need to be available to more hires and current employees trying to grow their VHA careers. We commend Chairman Woman Brownlee and Congresswoman Miller 
meets for their bill, HR 3693, the VA Continuing Professional CPE Modernization Act, which will increase CP amounts and provide it to more clinicians. We urge the committee to mark the bill up this year. Last, we want to again thank Chairman Takano for leading the charge on HR 1948, the VA Employee Fairness Act. If enacted, this bill would drastically help with recruitment and retention by allowing covered clinicians to grieve paycheck errors and stop managers from retaliating for bad schedules and leave denials. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to testify the today's hearing and I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Thank you. Uh, I now uh, uh, would like to uh, recognize Ms. Irma, Ms. Westmoreland for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Takano, Ranking Member Boast, and members of the committee for giving me the opportunity to speak today. My name is Irma Westmoreland. I'm a registered nurse at the Charlie Norwood VA Medical Center, Augusta, Georgia. I am also Vice President and Veterans Affairs Chair of National Nurses United, the largest nurses union association of registered nurses in the United States. In, as is the case in the private sector, VHA is facing a staffing crisis. This crisis existed before the COVID-19 pandemic, but it has been exacerbated over the past two years. Nurses are exhausted. We are dealing with profound moral injury from facing unbearable working conditions. As a result, VA nurses have left their jobs in high numbers, and the VA has been particularly slow at filling those positions. In its intent to increase recruitment and retention, the VA has consistently chosen to invest in updating dashboards and electronic systems such as HR Smart instead of investing in the proven solutions that we need. These include mandatory minimum staffing ratios to improve patient care, health and safety protections, more flexible schedules, competitive pay and benefits, and the right to collectively bargain over all issues. In my testimony today, I'm going to discuss two of the biggest barriers to nurse recruitment and retention at the VA, our inability to bargain collectively and the absence of safe staffing ratios. Every barrier to nurse recruitment and retention could be improved if clinical professionals in the VA had full collective bargaining rights. Right now, Section 7422 of Title 38 prohibits nurses and other clinical professionals in the VA from bargaining over patient care, peer review, and compensation. Registered nurses have a duty to advocate for our patients. Right now, we can't speak up to management about issues in the hospital that affect patient care and nursing practice. This prevents us from providing quality therapeutic care to veterans. In turn, poor working conditions, low staffing levels, and health and safety concerns make it difficult to retain nurses. We are prevented from bargaining over issues that impact nurse recruitment, including absurdly long hiring processes and pay discrepancies. My written testimony further detailed these issues. HR 1948, the employee here, Fairness Act introduced by Chairman Takano would provide the same bargaining rights to VA healthcare professionals as other federal employees, given RNs in the VA hospitals the tools to speak up for patient safety and care and improving recruitment and retention in the process. In my experience, the most single common reason why nurses choose to leave the bedside is that low staffing levels make the job unsustainable. The VA, like other health systems intentionally chooses to understaff hospital units and does not implement the mandatory minimum staffing ratios that nurses know protect the health and safety of patients and nurses alike. For example, in the med surge unit at my hospital, one nurse can be responsible for up to six or seven patients at a time. The safe staffing level for a med surge unit is one RN to four patients. These low staffing levels contribute to the large number of nurse vacancies. Right now, there are more than 1.2 million actively licensed registered nurses in the US who are currently not working at the hospital bedside. By implementing minimum staff ratios, we could bring nurses back to work at the VA while drastically improving patient care for our veterans. To support safe staffing at our hospitals, Congress must pass HR 3165, introduced by Representative Jan Schakowsky, which would establish minimum numerical RN to patient ratios in hospitals across the country, including the VA. Of course, 
Staffing issues at the VA are also related to the inability of nurses to collectively bargain. Last year at the Denver VA, management changed the nursing schedules for every inpatient unit, citing 7422 as the reason why it would not bargain over these changes with the union. These changes forced RNs to make their rounds at the same time, creating gaps in patient care. The inpatient units affected by these changes have lost over a dozen experienced RNs. As a result, the ICU has been particularly understaffed and RNs from other units are being floated to the ICU, even though they have not been properly trained. As this example shows, understaffing causes dangerous and safe situations for veterans and nurses at VA hospitals across the country. In conclusion, improving recruitment and retention at the VA does not require consultants or extensive dashboards of electronic data. It requires listening to and supporting the working nurses who deliver the most important service the VA offers care for our nation's heroes. We need safe staffing levels and we need full collective bargaining rights to protect the health and safety of both veterans and the nurses. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Westmoreland. Uh, Ms. Uh, without objection, I will uh, have uh, uh, Ms. Westmoreland and Ms. Burke's uh, entire written testimony uh, b included in the hearing record. I now recognize myself for five minutes um, of questioning. Uh, both of your organizations strongly support my bill, H.R. 1948, the VA Employee Fairness Act of, 19, of, of 2021. Um, please share with us some of the consequences of Title 38 employees not having collective bargaining rights. I'll begin with Ms. Moreland, uh, Ms., uh, with Ms. Westmoreland, um, uh, with the, your comments on NNU's perspective on what this means for those who are providing care for our veterans. Thank you. As nurses, we have a duty to advocate for our patients. Without full collective bargaining rights, we aren't able to do this, and patient care and health and safety are compromised as a result. There are just over 77,000 RNs that work at the VA. Together, we have years of collective nursing experience. And in this moment of crisis, the secretary is statutorily barred by Congress from bargaining with them over nursing practice, patient care protection, and compensation needed to recruit and retain them. Um, and Ms. Burke, do you have anything to uh, add from your perspective on, on what, the, what it means for Title 38 not having collective bargaining rights? Uh, thank you, Chairman Takano. I, I think the main issue is even when uh, VEA promulgates regulations on compensation and we try to grieve it for the failure of a, a nurse or a doctor uh, for the agency not following it, they can uh, trump us and when we move a grievance and say it's 7422. That doesn't help recruitment retention. Um, we have had experiences where um, People have signed uh, retention allowances and the agency doesn't pay it. That doesn't help. So we are into um, the Fairness Act so that we can retain people, quite frankly. Yes, and retention is, is, a, is a very, I think, acute crisis um, for uh, the VA at this particular moment. Um, VA said in its written statement that it has been, quote, maximizing bonuses and retention incentives to reward employees for excellent work and to be more competitive with private sector hospitals, unquote. Has that been the experience of many of the frontline clinical employees of, that your organizations represent? Um, uh, we'll start with Ms. Burke. Uh, thank you, Chairman. It's not the amount of locality uh, schedules that are out there. It's really, I feel, if the facilities have the budgets to implement them. Uh, currently, as you saw from the panel before, we are in tremendous amount of uh, desperate straits trying to recruit, especially inpatient uh, nursing staff in critical care uh, areas. Uh, we can't be the market pay leader, but we can uh, facilitate conditions of employment that entices people to become work at VA, but we're not even close. Um, and I can speak to some of the retention uh, sign-on bonuses that are in the area of, it's not even 15,000, now it's like 20,000. And so uh, it becomes extremely difficult if anything goes wrong on one of these units to retain uh, nurses, quite frankly. Um, 
Ms. Westmoreland, anything to add? Yeah, just qu quickly, I'd like to say thank the secretary for, of course, trying to give bonuses, but some of our members have received bonuses, but the application of the bonus has not been maximized and it's not been applied with any consistency or regularity. For example, in, at my facility, nurses on just the COVID units got some bonus, but the nurses who were detailed to work with them didn't. And so it's just not consistently done. And then you lose nurses because you can't retain them because you don't treat them fairly. So you say it's not consistently done because my next question was gonna be, has the majority of them of nurses no. seen, so it's not even, so it's some nurses have seen pandemic yes, sir. bonuses and it's very inconsistent. Um, uh, so AFGE and NNU together with three other unions that comprise the VA National Partnership Council sent a letter to Secretary McDonough on February 17th urging him to quote, take immediate action to educate VA employees on leave and benefits available to them during the COVID-19 public health emergency, end quote. Um, what has been missing from the department's efforts so far? Um, Ms. Westmoreland. The VA did send an email to all staff, including a listing about leave and benefits, but this is inadequate to get to address our concerns. We did send email and we, as far as I know, haven't gotten a response from the secretary. The department's efforts have resulted in inconsistent education to the staff, the nurses and the supervisors and makes it hard to enforce the policies that are available if they don't know how. Well, thank you. And Ms. Burke, my time is out, but if you can quickly give your answer if you have one. Uh, thank you. I, I think it needs to be better educated from the top down. Um, I've had one experience even in Indianapolis where a person was just fed up because she thought she was following the contract procedure. She was educated incorrectly. And uh, this becomes, these little minor issues become big issues uh, when they can just leave and get other jobs. Well, thank you. Uh, Ranking Member Bost, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Burke and Ms. Westmoreland, first off, thanks for being here. And, and I'm just kind of curious, what feedback are you getting? Uh, are you, have you been hearing from members about the VHA's vaccine mandates? Uh, Congressman Boast, um, I did not see your green on. I know you were trying to put your green on today. <laughs> uh, first of all, <laughs> Yeah, there's a sticker on the floor that was once on. <laughs> yes, okay. Um, the first thing I would like to say is, um, as a labor representative, I think these last two years, even though I've been an employee for like 26 years, have been the, like the most difficult um, that I've experienced as a labor representative. Sure. Uh, we um, represent wide variety of people with extreme views on either end of this uh, situation. I know people personally that have very strong views. Our job is uh, really to work due process. Um, as my knowledge of it in the status of we are where we are today, I don't think anyone has been terminated. Right, and, there, there's, uh, there's, there's about 35,000 that have actually requested the waiver, but they've not acted on it yet, but they're talking about acting on it, so. Yes, and so I think our our feeling is is that they're taking it um, case by case, and we'll see how um, our job responsibility is to make sure due process is occurring and uh, where those uh, situations um, occur, we are going to represent. Ms. Westmoreland. From any news perspective, any new believes in the medical science. We know that vaccines are an effective measure as part of multiple measures um, to the approach, which include distancing, testing, PPE, and isolation. And our nurses too have been on the front line using these PP using PPE and protected themselves and patients throughout these entire two years. The VA must continue to focus on the issues we know are driving nurses from the bedside, which are unsafe staffing, dangerous working conditions, pay discrepancies between nurses and the same job. We don't believe the issue um, is just this. We think that they need to process the accommodations like any other accommodation. When they had the flu vaccine accommodation where people took religious and medical examination, um, exemptions, they allowed them to use the appropriate PPE available, which was masking and is masking and continues to be masking. And if a nurse says they have a religious or an exemption to the vaccine for the flu, they allowed them to use the PPE. 
Well, yeah, I and, think and, they're going to do the same thing now. And then, then the I, it, it sounds like you do share, share the concerns that we have with your group because they are your employees, and, and they could be excellent employees in any other case. Uh, they've just got either whatever their reason might be. Uh, I just want to make sure that that uh, you know, as we talk about retention, that that we retain all of our good staff, and and while we're trying to add on more. Um, also, then I've got another question for both of you. You know, the American Hospital Association has called the healthcare work shortage a national emergency. Do you agree with that assessment? And if so, what should the VA do to meet that emergency? I'll go first. Uh, um, go ahead, DMJ. <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, Ranking Member um, Bose, thank you very much for th that comment. I think, first of all, um, Money is an issue, but I don't think it's going to solve the problem. I think we have to look scientifically at retention, turnover, uh, some of these data metrics. And uh, what I said in my t testimony sounds very cliche, but kindness, compassion, making sure comp competencies are hap happening, um, coaching. Uh, we have units that are critical care units that have terrific supervisors and we have other places that need a lot of help where they need a lot of help these people are going to leave and right. so when that happens we got to get ahead of it because we can't afford there's no one back in the back trying to backfill these places and so it's our job as union officials to make sure that we're voicing these concerns up to the executive leadership. Good. Good. Ms. West Warman, we've got about 20 seconds. Okay. HHS data proves that except for a handful of states, there's more than enough people with RN licenses to fill every open nursing position in the country. Actually, the shortage is a, is a shortage of safe nursing jobs with good working conditions. In order to bring back nurses to the bedside, we need to increase retention. We need to improve working conditions, starting with ensuring safe staffing levels and providing health and safety protections. I want to thank you both, and thank you for being here today. And with that, I yield back. Uh, thank you, Ranking Member Boss. Ms. Brownlee, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank the two of you for uh, being here today. Hearing from you is uh, critically important for us to get to really determine and find out what's happening on the ground. So thank you for, for sharing that. Uh, Ms. Burke, I wanted to ask you uh, first, and, and thank you, um, actually, for uh, bringing up my bill, the Continuing Professional Education Modernization Act. I appreciate uh, that very, very much. Um, I agree with you in terms of uh, what you testified and what you said, um, uh, both in your oral and written testimony. I wonder if you can just say a little bit more about why uh, this is the case and how, um, you know, how this bill uh, will help uh, impact uh, the VA's workforce uh, more positively. Right. First of all, um, thank you for sponsoring this legislation. Anything uh, that we can do to retain um, staff is so important right now. And right now, the pool of continuing education money isn't large enough. Uh, all employee survey says the main issue every year is professional growth. And so I see your bill as a situation where we don't have to fight so much among ourselves to get uh, professional education money. Additionally, I think it would be helpful to um, the situation to prioritize what congressional intents are. So right now, big in the agency is women's health. Uh, we could prioritize, uh, the education departments can prioritize and say, um, we need continuing education specifically for providers to go to women's health, uh, whether that's physical therapy in pelvic floor exercises, whether um, it's mental health people dealing with trauma. Uh, these are the things that I think are going to be helpful to, to the agency. Um, it may not make a huge difference but in retention, but these are conversations I have with my coworkers even. So anything helps. Thank you. Great. And do, I mean, it, it's there, um, is there a demand out there that can't be met just because the, there, there's not a, enough money to cover the cost? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. 
Okay. Matter of fact, uh, we were having this conversation um, like three months ago at, at our work. You know, we were all like, well, what's the system of getting professional education money? And I actually brought up, I said, well, we're trying to get uh, we're, uh, bipartisan leadership on this. So I hope it um, passes out of the House, and I think it's a great bill. Thank you so much. And uh, Ms. Westmoreland, you mentioned in your testimony that the uh, centralization of HR services at the VISN level has led to some success uh, in cutting down the length of time it takes to hire new nurses. Um, we've also heard today that this centralization hasn't worked uh, as well as planned, uh, you know, leading actually to staff shortages. So in your view, is there a balance to be struck here? Um, are there lessons that can be learned from centralization at, uh, at Vision 8 or other Visions across the country? Yes, I'm glad you bring that up. There is definitely lessons that can be learned. I mentioned Vision 8 because in the, their staffing of the cl clinical contact centers that they're having to staff pretty quickly, they have utilized their centralized system to make that happen so much faster. Every week I meet uh, with nurses and or every other week, new nurses that come through the door, they routinely tell me it takes four, minimum of four to a maximum of 18 months to get in the VA. And that is because the system that is centralized in most places do not work. Uh, and it doesn't work. I mentioned Vision 8 because in this instance, they did a great job of doing it. I think people can learn from them on how they did it. But we have not. We continue to have 100 days of, of an average to get a nurse in. That's three and a half months. And that bears out exactly what nurses tell me, a minimum of four months and more, many, many more long, longer, much, much longer. Yeah, I mean, that's just, I mean, w we just have to address that. I mean, how are we gonna compete in the private marketplace uh, when you are in such nurses, you nurses are in such you know, tremendous demand uh, the VA's already got one hand behind their back as it is, um, and then to take, you know, that long to hire somebody, I mean, that they've probably been offered 10 jobs in that time period. So um, exactly. it's, it's, just, it's just something that absolutely, uh, I think, has to, be, has to be addressed. Well, I see that my time is, is up, but th again, thank you both for uh, being here, and um, I will yield back to the chairman. Thank you, uh, uh, Chairwoman Brownlee. Uh, Ms. Rattlewagon, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I too would like to add my thanks to uh, Ms. Burke and Ms. Westmoreland. And I have a couple of questions for the both of you, uh, Ms. Burke and Ms. Westmoreland. Are there any private sector best practices that you think VHA should adopt for its own workforce? Thanks, Congresswoman. Um, I would say um, I have a niece right now that is um, graduating from nursing school, hopefully in May. And what she talked about is what we need to do uh, in a, uh, for VA in that was kind of mentioned a little bit by the prior panelists, but maybe not to the degree that it needs to be. And that is transition to practice type of programs, as well as the ability to shadow um, uh, different areas, increasing slots, um, it, that they get a full panoply of experiences so that they know what they wanna do. Um, I think that will help. Um, recruit uh, younger nursing coming out of schools and currently it's not where it needs to be in VA. Ms. Westmoreland. And I totally agree with that. She just took my statement totally, except for I'd like to also add that nurse practitioners um, are also at a very, uh, if we want to hire younger nurse practitioners and people that'll stay in our facility, we have to also transition that transition to practice program to them as well. We have a very limited number of slots at facilities for this, but if, if we don't do it, we're going to lose them because of the, of the complexities and the things that people need to learn when they come out, especially for nurse practitioners, we need to include we need to increase the transition to practice numbers for them, and for our nursing uh, nurses as they come out at each facility. It's a very limited program. They're talking about how great it is, but they haven't expanded it where they need to. So, Ms. Burke and Ms. Westmoreland, do you have any suggestions for how VA could better recruit 
and retain veterans? Ms. Burke? For, yes, um, veterans, they're wanting to come to VA, uh, obviously. Um, I think some of the demonstration projects where uh, we have health techs in the ED transitioning to PAs, um, working in the EDs, the Navy has gr a great PA program and physician assistants aren't um, really recognized at the level they should be uh, for the amount of service-connected veterans we have. Um, so I think that's one thing that we could do. Um, and additionally, um, we do some good peer support things in our mental health uh, aspect. But I think um, for nurses, I think we have a lot of uh, nurses or getting to more uh, service-connected veterans and veterans that are nurses. Um, but I don't think we just do some simple things like just recognize their service, um, like put a name tag, I'm a veteran, that should be a policy. Uh, because when you lean over a person and give them a shot, the guy looks up or the girl looks up and they say, oh, you're like me. And that becomes like a simple fix that could make a difference. Ms. Westmoreland. I also think in addition to all the things that MJ says, man, she's hard to follow, isn't she? Um, but all the things that she said in that area are very important. One of the things that, that we have to do is to bring them on board faster and easier. And I think if they, if we had some kind of program that would pipeline them from the military as they exit to the VA without taking so long to hire them. I mean, we've already we've already vetted them to the nth degree. They're working with our military, right? So how come we can't shorten a, make a program that will shorten their um, transition to us? But we also need to make sure that for the other nurses and these nurses as well, that we need to offer better working conditions like 72 for 80 and better staffing conditions. Our community hospitals always offer offer that and but they come to our facilities and don't have it we tell people they have to work around the clock hours but it, the community hospitals don't do that they tell them you can work days or evenings so there's a lot that we can do to not just bring military nurses back in and veterans in from a nursing perspective but all nurses as well thank you mr chairman yield back thank you Ms. radawagon mr rosendale uh you're recognized for five minutes thank you mr chair and Ms. Burke and Ms. Westmoreland, thank you so much for joining us today. Appreciate it. Uh, Ms. Burke, are you familiar with the or aware of the Cerner electronic health record system that the VA has been trying to implement for about 20 months now? Uh, I'm familiar. I, I haven't used it. Um, I'm familiar, sir, um, with some providers in the that are at VA's. Um, that had in the private sector used it. And uh, I know that we had a pilot project out in, I believe, Washington. That yes, that's it. That's it. Uh, and so I know the that facility. they're. Yes. So um, right. that's where they tried to roll this out. It's been, it's been in place for over 20 months now. And in short, it destroyed productivity at that facility. Are you aware of a poll that showed that about 80% of the employees at the Mangrand staff facility in Spokane have said that they would consider other employment as a direct result of that software program? 80%. I, I, <laughs> I'm familiar with that the rollout did not go well, and uh, but I did not know until you just educated me it was 80%. So then you wouldn't be aware that uh, they have reported 715 patient safety issues as a result of the Cerner program? No, sir. I, I wasn't realizing it was that bad. Yeah. Are you aware that they brought in an additional 400 FTEs they needed to be added so that they could try to work through this program? Wow. No, sir. Um, I, I glanced at, I think, the IG report, or um, there, I think there was a, either a GAO report, IG report, and uh, but I'm not familiar um, with it, all the intricacies yet. So if you're having recruitment and retention problems right now, how in the world would you address the required additional staff demands across the nation if the remaining 178 VA facilities that Cerner is proposed to be rolled out at uh, adopted that, that Cerner system. 
If we if we had to get a 400 additional FTEs in, in Spokane, how, how could we cover work, the, the balance of that workload? It wouldn't it wouldn't work, sir. That, uh, thank you. I, it was pretty simple math for me as well. So could you please join me in urging the VA and Secretary McDonough to uphold his assurances to us that he gave this committee that he would not roll this program out at Walla Walla, at Columbus, at these other facilities until he had it fully functioning at Spokane? Yes, sir. I'll do my best. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, I yield well thank you mr rosendale uh i believe that that uh, wraps up uh, all of the people all of the members who want to ask questions uh let me just uh, express my thanks uh to the va witnesses uh ms ms grosso and um I'm blanking that ms ms bonjourney who stayed through the testimony uh of uh of our uh, you know, employee representatives, our employee unions. I think that shows a great amount of uh, goodwill and interest. Uh, our, you know, um, our AFG and, uh, and then you representatives aren't in the room so they can't see that they're here, but I just wanted to make sure uh, that uh, I express my gratitude to uh, their, them. And I want to express my gratitude to Ms. Burke and Ms. West, Ms. Westmoreland for your testimony today. But let me point out that, uh, that Assistant Secretary for Human Resources uh, uh, Grosso uh, retired at the rank of Lieutenant General from the position of Deputy Chief of Staff uh, for Manpower, Personnel, and, Resor and Services, uh, where she served as the U.S. Air Force Chief Human, Human Capital Officer. And it's the first time she's appeared before this committee, though she's appeared before the uh, Armed Services Committee many times. Uh, we're grateful to your service and your continued interest in serving um, our country. Uh, and so uh, with that, I thank all the members for participating. Uh, Ranking member, would you like to say something? Yes, thank you. If I can, Mr. Chairman, thank you for yielding. I, I also want to thank each of our witnesses and uh, committee members. Uh, I appreciate them being here this afternoon, particularly those who are here in person, uh, to share their thoughts on, on this, this topic. And most of all, I want to thank the men and women working in the VA medical facilities, regional offices, veteran cemeteries, and administrative sites across the country. I want them to know that we, are work, that we work to do for, for veterans, does not, but the work they do for veterans doesn't go unnoticed, and I want to say a special thank you to them. You know, I promise you that we will keep doing our best on this committee to make sure your job is easier and make the services you provide even better uh, for our veterans. And with that, I yield back and thank you for the time. Uh, thank you, Ranking Member, and again, thank me. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank both panels for this informative hearing. Uh, all members will have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material. Again, thank you for appearing before us today, and this hearing is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.